Hello, Dr. Nick and Diglio. How are you doing today? Wonderful, Dr. Rick. How are you? Very good, thanks. Hey, Nick, uh, we're going to take a break uh, this uh, this session that we're together. We've been kind of working through the uh, Edutopia's 2023 most uh, important educational uh, study. So we've been kind of working our way slowly through that. But we're going to take a little pause on that. Uh, to to kind of take a look at a few videos that have been uploaded to YouTube by uh, by an educator who's speaking out about some of the strategies he uses, which I think have caught both your attention and my attention, and we thought would be valuable for us to kind of show and discuss on the show. So uh, I'm excited to do that. So Nick, why don't you kind of give the folks who are, are listening and watching an idea of who we're going to see and what we're going to see? All right. Well, you're going to see an educator named Brian Mendler, M-E-N-D-L-E-R. And uh, we're about to pull up his YouTube channel. You're going to see uh, a video that is called um, the That One Kid, the number one strategy for oppositional defiant kids. All of his books are available on Amazon. He also has a website that is available just strictly by Googling Brian Mendler. Um, and we'll also be giving, um, as we watch the video and then talk about it afterwards, uh, more citation uh, for referencing him. But very simply, Amazon and or a quick Google hit for Brian Mendler, again, M-E-N-D-L-E-R. Um, and again, a lot of his focus is on that one kid, oppositional defiance, um, and classroom management in particular. And with that said, we're going to go to his video now. Hey everybody, welcome back. And today we're talking about my number one strategy for kids who love to argue. Call them oppositional, call them defiant, but these kids will argue everything. These are kids where you can tell them it's nice out and they're like, no, it's not, it's beautiful. And you're like, right, that's what I said. And they're like, no, you said nice and it's beautiful and they're two totally different things. And you're like, right, well, I know, but they're basically the same thing. And they're like, no, it's not because nice means this and beautiful means that. These are kids who will get you into a conversation and you will look back and say, where the heck did the last 10 minutes of my life just go? Because these kids are good at taking us in circles. The number one strategy for kids who love to argue is to use questions instead of statements. Think about it like this. For kids who love to argue, statements are their fuel. Questions are their kryptonite. I said, sit down. No, yes, no, yes, no, yes. Boom, you're in a power struggle versus, hey, come here, come here. I want to talk to you. Can you please explain to me why you think it's okay to stand instead of sit? Why do you think that's an okay thing to do right now? I'm just curious. Instead of ready, we don't talk to adults like that. It becomes, hey, hey, come here. I want to talk to you. Come here, come here. I'm curious. Where in your life have you learned to talk to adults like that? Who in your life talks to people that way where you think that's an okay way to talk to me? Because I know that's not you talking. Who is that inside there talking? Notice how by using a question, I disarm the student. I take the argument away from them. And that's always the goal. The goal is to take the argument away from the kid. Here's a strategy that I want you to try. It's actually a challenge. Pick one day of your life. I don't care what that day is. And here's what you're going to do. From the minute you wake up in the morning until the minute you go to bed at night, no matter what anyone does, no matter what anyone says, for one full day, you're only allowed to use questions and see what happens. Mr. Mendler, what? What's the homework going to be? I don't know. That's a good question. What do you all think it should be? You think it should be 10 problems, 15 problems? Here's an idea. How about I give you 20 problems and you pick whichever five you want? What do you think about that? Mr. Mendler, what? What's the consequence going to be if I break that rule? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question, and I'm not sure. What's it going to take to get you to stop calling people names? I mean, you and I both know the first five things I tr I've tried this year haven't worked. Do you have any ideas for me? Notice how by when, using a, when I take my time to use a question, I put all the decision-making back on the kid. And generally, kids who love to argue, oppositional kids, are lacking power and control in their life. Either one of two things is happening. Power and control is the root cause of their behavior. So being inappropriate, calling out, being disrespectful, talking back, arguing, that's not the problem. It's the symptom slash solution to the problem. The real problem is 
I'm a kid who really needs power and control in my life. And the thing is, power and control, there's two different kinds of power and control kids. Let's keep it simple, call it power control A and power control B. Power and control A kid is the kid who goes home and they believe in their life that they're in complete power and they have complete power and control. And the truth is they do. These are kids who go home and they play, play video games all night. They hang out till whatever time. They watch TV all night. There's no structure very really in their life. These are parents where you and I will try to call the parents, set up an appointment. We might get a hold of them. We might not. Sometimes they make an appointment and then they don't show up. So these kids are like, yo, I got complete power and control in my life. And then all of a sudden I come to school and you teacher, you're trying to take that from me. And I don't want to give that up very easily. I'm holding on to this thing tight. I don't have a whole lot in my life. And the little bit that I do have, I want to hold it. And now you're trying to take it away. So notice how by using a question, I put that power and control back on the kid. And then there's the other home life which is the home life of certain teachers, truthfully, right? This is the home life where, you know, it's everything is so incredibly structured and organized. The kid feels like they have no power and control. This is the kid where it's like you have football practice from three o'clock until three, until 4.45. At 4.45, I will pick, be picking you up for piano lesson. That will go until 5.15. At 5.15, you will get done with there and then we'll be home by 5.30. At 5.30, you will have dinner. That will last until 5.45. At 5.45, you will do your homework. And when you're done with your homework, you will take a shower. When you're done taking a shower, you read a book. And when you're done reading a book, you can go to bed. These are the kids where literally every single detail of their life is thought out for them. And so they're craving power and control because they don't get it in their life. So power and control is the problem. The solution to the problem is that the kid is defiant. The kid is arguing back. So one of the best strategies you can use, questions instead of statements. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up button. Leave me a comment below. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you didn't like. And tell me some kids. Give me some issues that you might be dealing with or struggling with that I can put videos out for. All right, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed and I'll see you on my next one. Take care. Peace. All, all right. right. There it is. Yeah, uh, Nick, I've got lots of reactions uh, to to Brian's uh, video here. Uh, it, it, I mean, let me just start by saying, what a great presenter! You can just feel his emotion coming through, right? He yes. cares about this. It's it's what he does for a living is not only inspire kids, but you can see he's inspiring us <laughs> as well. At the same time, he's inspiring other educators, and we talk a lot about that on the show. And so, uh, yeah, I just I, I appreciate that. I appreciate kind of the approach he uses and the attitude he has for sure. Uh, yeah, and also the the just the easy reminder where he's not hitting you with seven hundred things at once. He's yeah. focusing on one tip, uh, one easy way to kind of talk about something that is easy to forget, particularly in the classroom when you're caught up in the heat of emotion, particularly with a kid who is potentially oppositional defiant, uh, which some kids can be all the time, and every kid can be some of the time. Yeah. Uh, for sure there. Um, and picking this particular strategy, which is using questions instead of declarative control statements over kids, um, definitely uh, changes the game and switches the script uh, on the student a little bit. Um, does it always work? Well, of course not. Nothing always works. But it very, very much oftentimes puts a pause on the student and for the teacher as well. And what it definitely does for the teacher is that as the heightened emotion begins, right? Because you're in the middle of a circuit that begins. It's a loop. Heightened emotion starts, right? Misbehavior. Teacher starts getting fired up, fired up, fired up, fired up. Boom. The teacher can break that own heightened emotion circuit that's being built by moving into the uh, flipped script scenario there. So it's almost like the uh, the, stra the uh, neurological strategies of uh, taking a sip of water or looking upwards, pointing your eyes upwards towards the ceiling that automatically forces neurologically the body to calm down, to move into a more calm state. This is another way to break that neurological loop and do that. Yeah, Nick, that's a great point because this works on it, it, uh, on both people, right? Involved in the power struggle, right? It, it works on the kiddo yep. kind of, there's an empowering piece of I'm asking you a question. I'm empowering you to help provide the solution or to give me a response towards the solution. And there's also that piece you were just alluding to of tapping into curiosity, 
the kind of curiosity is kind of a different part of the brain than anger, right? And judgment, it, it's operating from the prefrontal cortex, not back from the amygdala, right? So we're, yeah, it, it's a different part of the brain and I think can kind of release some of the tension that we're feeling, you know, when we are at risk of maybe getting into one of those power struggles to be sure. Yeah, I, I love this idea of just kind of, tapping into the curiosity, asking questions. It was reminding me of, Nick, I don't know if you remember, not the more recent version of, of uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Because I don't know that they play this game. I don't know if you remember when Drew Carey uh, was the kind of the, the guy in the seat and Wayne Brady and Colin Mockery and Ron Siles. And they did the question game where, you know, you, they, they pop in and they just, they could only ask questions. And he'd buzz them out if they made yes. a statement. I love that game. But anyway, that I was looking up a, a few, uh, a few old clips of that and laughing right before we get on today. Um, another thing I think that he kind of alludes to here, Nick, is uh, the indirectly is at the start, he kind of talks about kind of the danger of telling kids what to do of these statements or these orders or directives. And yeah, it's it's one of the reasons, and there are a lot of them, why as counselors and therapists, but also as teachers or coaches, um, it, <laughs> Of course, there's times for told coaches to be giving directives. I'm not suggesting otherwise, but and teachers as well. But uh, when we ask, when we give advice, that's one of the dangers in giving advice. Is if you're you're working with a teenager, developmentally, one of the problems with with that is you tell me what to do, I'm going to do the opposite. <laughs> Because I'm my own person, I'm making my own decisions, and I'm just going to do the opposite of what you say. So I've got to be careful about giving advice to teenagers. However well-intentioned, it can backfire on us for that very reason. There's other problems with advice as well, but that's at least one of them. And I think that's at least part of what he's give, getting getting uh, at here. It's also one of the reasons why as counselors or therapists, if we're running a small group, uh, rather than setting the ground rules, we invite the students in the small group to create the ground rules, right? It, it, and in so doing, they become invested in the group and invested in following the rules because the rules aren't yours later. The rules are ours. We came up with them. Oh, oh that makes it a little different. Maybe I better do what I said I was going to do. All right. So lots of good stuff here. And let me hit on one more and then I'll, I'll give you a chance to jump in. Um, you know, he's talking about the, the, the need that kids have for power and control. Well, that's right out of Counseling Theory 101. That's William Glasser's reality therapy is what it is. In fact, Glasser says, I love his theory for lots of reasons, but one of them is this real quickie diagnostic tool. When you're working with any kiddo, there's five basic needs, and most of the misbehavior that we see is coming from a, 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 a unhelpful way to get needs met or a way that gets needs met, but that's also not very productive for kids. And, and so here they are, survival, freedom, fun, love and belonging. And here's, here's the big one he's getting at, power and control. And if one of those needs in a kid's life is not being met, they're going to find ways to get them met, even if they end up being not very productive or harmful, you know, in, in some fashion. And uh, yeah, I had something else I wanted to say about that. What was it? Uh, yeah, maybe that was it. Maybe that was it. I had to gather my thoughts, but lots of things going on here. And this is a five minute clip that I think are, are relevant for anybody who kind of works with kids, leads kids, coaches, parents, teachers, uh, lots of folks kind of thinking about how you're interacting with kids and can you make slight changes to those interactions to be more effective? Because we all just want to be effective, right? We want kids to be productive and do well. And so can I make some little changes to how I'm interacting to help that process? And it's the reminder, I think, that we're disarming, right? Mm. Like part of what we're doing is disarming. When you look at, um, I always look back in, in, into the, the 90s, the 80s and 90s and shows uh, like Cops, right? My dad used to love watching Cops. And that would always show uh, the most ridiculous scenarios, uh, the most heightened situations. But if you actually were watching that show, um, the, the, the clips that made the commercials were you know, the, the crazy stuff. But most of the situations on the actual half hour or 60 minute show were familiar people to the police officers. And the attempt that always happened were conversations where the police officers had relationships with the people and they were just trying to disarm them with trust and relationship building, right? You know, the, the drunk guy sitting behind the wheel of his car and then trying to have a conversation to get him from out from behind the wheel so he didn't drive him with somebody. Or, you know, the person at the convenience store who was probably dealing drugs and trying to get him to go home so there were no drugs being dealt, dealt that night. Disarming. That's 
a lot of times the main the main idea there. And I also like how uh, in the in the segment here he talked about the two types of power and control. You know, like it's not always the same. It's the same outcome, power and control. But type A power and control is the kid who at home is has all the power and control, or B the kid who has no power and control and wants it at school. So there's it, it's it's is it the same thing in a sense however the way you can ask those questions and disarm the situation look a little bit different depending on um who that kid is and what their um intended outcome actually is there yeah it's a good point nick i, I would make an addition to, to something brian suggested there because he talked about two different reasons why a kiddo would be needing kind of had this lack of power and control. And you, you hit upon them quite well there. One is the laissez-faire form of parenting or guardianship, right? Where you do what you want, like, and you're used to power and control. So you're just going to go and, and, and use that. And the, and the other one is uh, the authoritarian parent. Everything is structured exactly every day. And so I have no control over what I do. And, and the, there's another, there's a third one though. I think maybe that he didn't address that's important for, for all of us is that we've got kids who've experienced some form of trauma. Uh, not of their own making, right? And so we're talking about kids who have been abused, who are homeless, maybe the death of immediate family member. Those kids are powerless over those situations, right? And so there's a there's a lack, there's this vacuum of power and control. And so it's a natural kind of reaction to get that field by ordering others to do what you want them to do, acting in ways that are not very functional, but are productive and helping you experience that feeling. Yeah, for sure. So, 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 so much packed into just this short five minute clip there. Um, and that's just a little bit of, uh, the, the wisdom that uh, Brian has to offer across many avenues there. So again, head on to Amazon, any one of his books. He also does, uh, has published a few books with his brother there, and I'm sure we'll revisit more of his video and, um, you know, some of his tips as we go along too. Yeah. And uh, Nick, I got two more quick points here I, I want to make. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, real quick. Uh, one is, and I noticed in the video, uh, something that he did as he was kind of, you know, recalling or role playing right, with himself, kind of imagining, kind of talking with the kid is he changed his tone of voice to almost a whisper. Right. right? And and we, we just talked about that on the show. Right. We just talked about that as, as one of those ed utopias. Uh, most important yes, research did. studies of 2023 is this idea of, of 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 changing your tone of voice, of of being intentional with your tone of voice, and being soothing with your tone of conveying warmth with your tone of voice. So he does those yes. kind of things too. It's not always just about asking the questions, but it's managing the tone of voice in order to make connection. And I noticed, Nick, you were even doing the same thing when you were talking about the cops episodes, right? You were the, the, the police officers changing their tone of voice to be non-aggressive, right? And to be relational and convey warmth as a way to kind of, uh, what was the word used? It's such a good one. Uh, disarm, disarm as, as a way to disarm, disarm yeah. the folks. So yeah, that's, that's excellent. You, you know, having watched a few of these clips from uh, Brian Mendler, I was reminded of one other thing, Nick, and uh, I wanted to read it. And I, you probably know this. I imagine you do, but uh, it's the prayer of St. Francis. Oh my gosh. That's, wear it on my dog tag every day. Oh, you do? Oh, fantastic. I didn't know that. Okay. Well, yeah. I love the prayer of St. Francis. And I was reminded of that recently. And, and of course, in watching his videos, I'm reminded of him probably kind of just, just getting a sense of who he is as an educator, that, that likely this is something that he would, yeah, it, <laughs> embrace. I, I'm, sh I'm sure. Yeah. So let, let me go ahead and read that. Uh, the prayer of St. Francis. And actually, it's kind of weird as you investigate this. I don't know if St. Francis actually said this, even though we know it is the prayer of St. Francis. It's difficult to discern if he actually is the one who wrote these words or said these words first. Mm -hmm. But he's at least attributed to being it's uh, it's consistent with his character and, and what he did. Oh, yeah. He definitely believed these things, even right. if he didn't write them down. Right. So the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where is there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Beautiful words. Hmm. 
Yep, it's my favorite oh, there one. It is. Yeah. Fantastic. Good stuff. Yeah, I don't know why the cam- I don't know why my Osbot camera is shaking like that, but <laughs> now I'm now I'm dizzy. On top of that, yes, and um, one of the other ones with Brian Miller that ties right to that Rick, which I'm sure at some point we'll we'll get to when he talks about uh, the second to last word is best. You know what I mean? Like his his uh, part of his point mm. is that you don't always have to have the last word, and I, I, I everything you just read there in terms of you know m- making an instrument of your piece. Mm-hmm peace right he's it, it's we're not looking to we're not looking to flame the fire we're looking to put the fire out we're looking to you know bring light instead of uh you know burning the world down essentially so yeah. uh, i think that there's definitely a lot of uh similarities there if we ever get a chance to interview brian that would be an interesting question that to would ask be cool sure. yeah 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 yep sometimes walking away is the uh is the, the strong answer there for sure Thanks, Nick. What was the What was the Kenny Rogers song about? Uh, you got to know the county. I don't know that one. Uh, everyone considered him the count of the county. He would always walk away, turn the other cheek. Actually, that ends kind of violently. <laughs> that's not a good example. Okay. We're, I don't want to recall that we, one. <laughs> we We want the last thought on this segment to be. The prayer of San Francisco. So <laughs> we're gonna have our people. We're gonna have our people remember that as the <laughs> sounds good. The memory for that one. All right, everyone. Well, a uh, uh, great piece here. We'll uh, we'll be back with more excellent educational tips from Rick and Nick's excellent adventure.